Section 1. You will now hear a conversation between a university student and the agent of a student job centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recordings a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Excuse me, is this the Student Job Centre? My friends told me it's somewhere between room 401 and room 405, so I... You've come to the right place. This is the Job Centre. How can I help you? Thank goodness. I'm looking for a part-time job. Can you help me with that? I certainly can. But I need to take some of your details first. Can I have your full name, please? Yes, it's Denise Goth. G-O-U-G-H. You can call me Denise. Are you a full-time student, Denise? Yes, I'm a junior student in the Business Administration Faculty. All right. Now I need your contact details. What's your phone number? It's 089-18220. 220. Got it. And where do you live? Sorry, but why do you need my address? I think it's more convenient for you to contact me by phone. Yeah, sure. But we also need your address so that we can try to find a job that is near where you live. Oh, OK. Well, that'd be great. I live at 15 Adern Avenue. It's A-E-D-I-R-N. Oh, I know the place. That's in Ennis, isn't it? Yes, that's right. OK, now, Denise. Have you done any work before? Hmm. I've tried my hand at a few things, but I'd say there are only two jobs that are worth mentioning. The first job I had was like two years ago. I worked as a private tutor for secondary school students for about eight months. Right. And what about the other one? The second one is probably the best job I've ever had, which I'm currently still doing. I'm working as a games translator for a company called Ubisoft. Not actually a well-paid job, but the working environment is amazing. Ubisoft? I think I've heard the name before. Is it a French company? Yes, it is. So... You can speak French, then? Yes, I got a C1 certificate a couple of months ago. Do you speak any other language? I can speak Polish, too, actually. It's my mother tongue. I see. So apart from that, do you have any other skills? I've been learning to play the violin for eight years now. Can that be considered as a skill? It certainly is. OK, the last question. Do you have any special interests? Well, I'm a huge fan of video games, and I like playing sports too. All right, Denise. I think I've got everything I need for now. I will check the job ads and see if there's anything that's suitable for you. Just wait a moment, please. It won't take long. OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK, so there are three options that may interest you. The first one is at a bar called Lilac and Gooseberries. They're looking for a bartender and they also say that speaking French is a big advantage. OK, so what does the job involve? Of course, apart from the obvious, like mixing drinks, taking orders or planning the menu. 
It says here that you also have to check if all customers are over the legal drinking age. Hmm, sounds simple enough. What are the working hours? They need to hire someone for the night shift. It's from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Wednesdays and Fridays. Excuse me, 2 a.m. Yes, but don't worry. There's a police station nearby, so it's a perfectly safe place if you have to get home on your own. It's not my safety that I'm concerned about. I've been learning karate for five years now, and those who dare to touch me will regret the day they were born. Actually, I'm concerned because I have lectures on Thursday and Saturday mornings, starting at 7 a.m. So if I work until 2 a.m., it will be almost impossible for me to make it that early in the morning to class. I think I have to say no to this job. I see. Hmm. Well, how about this one? There's a position for a part-time violin teacher at the Angoulême Music Academy. It's on every weekend from 6 to 8 p.m. Is that suitable for your schedule? Yeah, I'm free all weekend. So what does the job involve? Please tell me I don't have to teach children because I really hate teaching kids. It doesn't say anything about teaching children. It just says you'll be in charge of a class for beginners. Oh, and one more thing. You will be required to wear the academy's uniform. Uh, no, thank you. I can't stand wearing uniforms. What's the last option? This one's really interesting. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this before. It's a position for a、uh, voice actress for a game developer called CD Project Red. It's a Polish company, so obviously you have a clear advantage over other candidates. Voice actress, really? That's what I always wanted to do since I was a little kid. What are the working hours? It says you can come to the recording studio any time you want, except for Mondays. And it says here that candidates who can speak with a British accent will be given preference. That shouldn't be a problem for me, and I love working flexible hours. Oh, I almost forgot. Where is the studio located? The address is. Seventy-four Krakow Street, Ennis. Ah, so it must be near your house. Not really. I've been to that area once. It took me more than thirty minutes to get there by bus, and I'm not really a fan of using buses. But I can't miss out on such a wonderful opportunity. Can you give me their contact details so that I can ask for more about the job? That's the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a tour guide talking about a tourist attraction called the Winchester Haunted House. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Good afternoon, everyone. You're now standing right before the famous Winchester Haunted House, one of the most interesting and also scariest places in the country. This facility was built around ten years ago and aims to provide visitors with the best horror experience. This house has taken inspiration from several different horror stories from all over the world. And each room in the house has been designed to truly reflect those stories and bring the most frightening experience to those who dare to enter. It's located right here in the centre of the most popular theme park in town, so it's quite easy to find. Now, before we go in, there's some information that I'd like you to know. Due to the content inside the house, children under 13 must remain outside. And in addition. 
If you have any particular medical problems like heart disease or epilepsy, we also advise you not to enter the house. After today, if you're interested and want to revisit the house, please note that the house is open every day of the week except on Monday when it's closed for maintenance. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, let me tell you something about the unique features inside the house and their origins. There's six rooms, each of which is created based on a particular theme or story, and I'm sure that in addition to experiencing frightening and horrifying scenes, you may also gain an understanding of the meaning behind each story. The first room is called the Asylum. It was created based on a very famous story of a mental hospital in Korea that was abandoned after the mysterious deaths of several patients. This room is a replica of the creepy looking hospital where you will hear the voices of the dead souls and even encounter some supernatural beings. The next room is called the tomb, which was designed in an Egyptian style. It reflects the story about a horrific ritual that was recorded in Egyptian history. You know, things like summoning the dead or sacrificing people for the sake of the gods. I'm sure you'll be screaming very loudly when you see these things with your bare eyes. Now, if you're interested in some Western horror, the Operation Room might be the place for you. This room took inspiration from the diary of a doctor investigating the famous mass murderer Ed Gein in the US who committed several terrifying murder crimes. This room in particular has many bloody, gory scenes and you're advised to have an empty stomach when going through this room because you know what I mean. Now, going back to Asia, people who are interested in Chinese culture may like our altar room. In this room, you'll experience the creepy details of a Chinese horror story while witnessing hungry and aggressive spirits wandering around. The next room, the warehouse, features a popular story from this country. It's the story of the famous English weapons trader from the 18th century and the spirits of those who died from his guns that eventually returned to haunt him. And finally, the last room we have here is called the hall, where you'll be confronted by the spirit of a young girl who died painfully in her own home and returned to haunt those trespassing her house. Many people say that this story originated in Thailand, but actually, it's a very popular Japanese urban legend. Well, I hope that you all have a wonderfully horrific experience inside the house. Now, please stand in line to enter the first room. That's the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will now hear a university student discussing with her professor about her assignment for an international business class. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. All right, I've finished reading the first draft of your essay about Starbucks's short-lived invasion on Australia's coffee culture. I think this will be a good case study for the assessment. Thank you, Professor. To be honest, at first there were so many topics that I wanted to cover, like Walmart's failure in Japan or Amazon in China. I thought Starbucks's story would be boring. Everyone knew about it. Yes, many other students said the same thing. So why the change of heart? Well, initially, I chose Walmart and I expected that finding the academic sources would be the most challenging part, as I usually struggle when it comes to finding good articles. Luckily, though, since Walmart is a big company, there were ample academic sources about this incident, so it wasn't an issue. Then I saw many of my classmates working on the same project, and I was a bit afraid. I mean, if their reports were well written, it could hurt my score a little, right? So in the end, I decided to write about the story of Starbucks, which I also had a lot of background knowledge and understanding of in advance. Hmm, smart decision. So the first requirement of this assignment is to give some general information about the business, and it seems like you haven't included that part. Why not? Yeah, sorry. The company's background is the easiest part, so I've saved it for last. I did look into the company's website and found some interesting facts, though. I've written a note here. Beginning with a small coffee store in Seattle in 1971, Starbucks pioneered the introduction of the Italian coffeehouse tradition to American coffee lovers and became the world's largest coffee chain, with more than 24,000 stores in 70 nations as of 2017. Good. But remember you have to briefly mention their global expansion process as well. Maybe try to look at other websites rather than just their homepage. Actually, you can find that information on their homepage pretty easily, where they talk about their history and development. For example, Starbucks opened their first retail store abroad in Tokyo in 1996, before moving to China two years later, and gained enormous popularity in both countries. With continuous victories in Asian markets, Starbucks decided to then enter Australia's coffee industry, whose value was worth $3 billion at that time. OK, nice. Now, for the failure analysis, you highlighted two reasons. The lack of effective globalisation strategies and cultural understanding. Which one is more crucial? Regarding international tactics, the American coffee giant expanded too rapidly and tried to impose the brand on customers. Instead of letting Australian coffee lovers discover the Starbucks story, which succeeded in the US with one single store, followed by gradual openings of the second and the third, Starbucks brought about an uncomfortable customer experience by setting up multiple outlets on every street corner. But the main contributor would be Starbucks's underestimation of the differences between the Australian market and others. OK, so what did you find out about those differences? Well, being unaware of Australians' coffee preferences, Starbucks mimicked what worked in the US, which was weak coffee with sweet-flavoured syrups. But Australians preferred real strong and bitter espresso coffee. Agreed. I tried Starbucks once and I hated it. I also outlined some recommendations if Starbucks wished to re-enter this sophisticated market. First, the pace of expansion must also be toned down to create scarcity and demand and let the customers explore Starbucks themselves. Also, Starbucks must concentrate more on what is appealing to Australians. OK, so what exactly did you find out about the Australian coffee culture? Australia already established a rich and sophisticated coffee culture with the ultimate love for a true dark roasted cup of coffee with less milk and condensed syrup. In addition, coffee for Australians is as much about the relationship as it is about a product. Once they like your coffee, they'll become a loyal customer and are willing to travel a fair distance on a daily basis for a good cup of coffee. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Oh, and there's one more part I'm not sure if I should include. Oh, what's that? I also did some research about Starbucks's local competitors to understand how they successfully operate in Australia. That's great. Readers can understand more about Starbucks' mistakes. So, what did you find? The leading coffee chain at the moment is Gloria Jeans, which dominates the high street sector of the coffee retailing market with about 500 stores. Peter Irvine, one of Gloria Jeans' co-founders, noted that US retailers often arrive in Australia thinking the size of their overseas chains and the strength of their brand in other markets will make it easy for them to crack the local market. Their focus is on global domination rather than the needs of the local consumers. That's why they fail. Hmm. I know Peter personally, actually. He's a very talented CEO. It seems like he understands Starbucks' situation quite well. Yeah. He also pointed out one of Starbucks' crucial mistakes that was all of the 200 stores are company-owned instead of franchises, which is an expensive model and lead to Starbucks' average price for a cup of coffee being the highest amongst all examined brands. Yes, and it's just a bucket of milk. How about other competitors? Other significant competitors include the Coffee Club and Hudson's, all offer a similar in-store experience to Starbucks, with the Coffee Club from 2007 onwards refurbishing many of its stores to imitate the Starbucks' experience, from the high-quality service and ambiance, as well as providing premium coffee to justify the high price. Meanwhile, Hudson's takes over the convenience end and has the lowest average price for a cup of coffee at $3.10. Although it helps them to gradually grow, they won't become a major competitor as price is not the most essential factor for most Australian coffee lovers, who will go out of their way to purchase a good cup of coffee. OK, interesting. So, did you find out anything else? Oh, and there is an interesting case of McCafe, which is also from the US. Surprisingly, it managed to survive here thanks to a sustainable business model with a full range of breakfast, lunch and dinner items that can accompany a McCafe latte. McCafe is widely recognised as the fastest growing cafe brand in Australia and New Zealand, proving it is actually not impossible for foreign coffee brands to succeed in Australia. You are without a doubt on the right track. I look forward to reading your final draft. Be careful of the word limit, though. Thanks, Professor. That's the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about second language acquisition. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. My name is Robert Dawson. It's nice to see you all. My lecture today is about the mechanics of second language acquisition 
and I hope that such knowledge will be beneficial to you in your future teaching career. As you may know, every language has its own set of rules for speaking and writing the language properly, and individuals trying to learn a new language often blur the lines between which set of rules to use. Second language learners also face a certain degree of fear or anxiety about tackling a new language, which can, in turn, affect how easily or how well they are able to acquire the language. Anne Oliveri, a teacher with more than 30 years of experience teaching English as a second language, describes second language acquisition as a learning continuum because the person learning a new language progresses from no knowledge of the new language to a level of competency closely resembling that of a native speaker. Advocates of second language acquisition theories, including Oliveri and Judy Haynes, another ESL teacher with 28 years of experience, identify five distinct stages of second language acquisition as originally theorized by linguist Stephen Krashen. The first of these stages is the silent or receptive stage. This stage may last from several hours to several months, depending on the individual learner. During this time, new language learners typically spend time learning vocabulary and practice pronouncing new words. While they may engage in self-talk, they don't normally speak the language with any fluency or real understanding. This stage is controversial among some language educators. Anna Lomba disagrees that second language learners are totally silent while they are in the first learning stage. Instead, Lomba states that speech is fundamental in language acquisition and learners excel in language acquisition when they apply what they learn as they learn it. The second stage is called early production. This stage may last about six months during which language learners typically acquire an understanding of up to a thousand words. They may also learn to speak some words and begin forming short phrases even though they may not be grammatically correct. Let's move on to the next stage, speech emergence. By this stage, learners have typically acquired a vocabulary of up to 3,000 words and can communicate by putting the words in short phrases, sentences and questions. Again, they may not be grammatically correct, but this is an important stage during which learners gain greater comprehension and begin reading and writing in their second language. The fourth stage is called intermediate fluency and may last for a year or more after speech emergence. Learners typically have a vocabulary of as many as 6,000 words. They usually acquire the ability to communicate in writing and speech using more complex sentences. This crucial stage is also when learners begin actually thinking in their second language, which helps them to gain more proficiency in speaking it. The final stage is called continued language development, or advanced fluency. It takes most learners at least two years to reach this stage, and then up to ten years to achieve full mastery of the second language in all its complexities and nuances. Second language learners need ongoing opportunities to engage in discussions and express themselves in their new language in order to maintain fluency in it. The key to learning a new language and developing proficiency in speaking and writing that language is consistency and practice. A student must converse with others in the new language on a regular basis in order to improve their fluency and confidence. In addition, Haynes says it's important for students to continue to work with a classroom teacher on specific content related to the new language, such as history, social studies and writing. That's the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That's the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.